Pastor Adrian, good to see you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you for doing this. Lord. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, I was super excited to do this for a number of reasons, but uh, I think you're a guy I've always looked up to when I was going through my things, my uh, struggles. But one thing I looked up to you about is you always pointed us towards Christ. Yeah. And um, it was like, I think we admired your actions and the way you did things, but you always point us towards Christ. So thank you for that. That's, that's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> Part I of the job description, right? That's right. <clears throat> I wanted to start by talking about Shep. Pastor okay. Sam. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was hoping you might have a story about him or. Uh, I have some great stories. Yeah. All right. I'll give you one of my favorites. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Pastor Sam, you know, were you on his? Yeah, the bombers. Yeah, the bomb squad. So, um, uh, so for viewers that don't know, Teen Challenge has rally teams that will go out to churches. We'd sing, we'd share our testimonies, right? And um, and all of them had a nickname. Uh, Pastor Sam Bombera, who's a who's still a great friend of both of ours. Um, he he led a team, and they called it the Bomb Squad because his last name was Bombera. So. And uh, so one time I was with Pastor Dan Proust. Did you know Pastor Dan? Uh, I think I met him, but I didn't know him. So, or no, 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 I take that back. I took the rally team out this weekend. Um, and so it wasn't Pastor Dan. Pastor Dan was still men's director, but I took a team out. So I don't know where we were. We were in, uh, we were like out of town. We were in Indiana or somewhere. And so driving back, we were coming in on uh, 31 coming through uh, Grand Haven. Okay. And somebody, <coughs> excuse me, somebody saw Pastor Sam's van in a restaurant. There was a Hardee's or something. And uh, they're like, oh, I just saw Pastor Sam's van. And so I was driving. And so I slowed down and I made a U-turn to go back to the restaurant. And everyone's like, what are you doing? You know, Adrian. And, and I said, let's go steal his hubcaps off the van. And they're like, what? I was like, let's go. Cause his van had sp like sport rims. I said, let's go, let's go get the sport rims off his van. And, and everyone's laughing and they're like, how are we going to get them off? And some, someone in the back goes, Hey, I just found a screwdriver. I'm like, perfect. Let's, I said, so here's a plan. So I pulled over to the side of the road. I said, we're going to pull in. I said, two of you jump out, pop those things off, jump back in the van and we're going to take off. And everyone's laughing, everyone's fired up. And so um, I pull in and Pastor Sam, they, they weren't seated yet. And he sees me in the window. You know how he always does the point. Oh, yeah. And uh, oh. I'm waving at him. He's like, oh, you know, <laughs> hey. And, and uh, we were like, go, go, go. And so the van opens up, you know, we open up the door and, and, and uh, four guys jump out. And uh, one of them, I think, had a butter knife or a pen and one had a screwdriver. They jump out. They run over the van and Pastor Sam's watching what we're doing. He's like, you know, like, what are you doing? And they're popping these things off. And so they all come running out. So I was like, hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> they pop the, the sport caps off and they all jump back in the van and, and we take off and Pastor Sam runs out in the parking lot. He's like, you know, doing like this, this uh, Al Pacino thing in the yeah. parking lot. We were laughing. Their team. Like the guys were, they were rolling, man. And they're looking at the van and we, we peel out, you know, we're, we come back. And so when we get back to the center, Pastor Dan was taking everyone's money, you know, cause when you come back off rally, you know, if you have cash on, you oh, gotta yeah. turn it back in, put on your books. So it's not like taking a lunch money. Yeah. Right. So, so everyone, so, so we have stop in the office. So. Uh, you know, my guys come out, I, I had, I don't know, eight or nine guys with me. And so, so they're giving Pastor Dan all their money and he's putting, you know, putting in their books with their name. And then I come in with, with four sport caps, right? And Pastor Dan looked at me and, and he, he just looks at me, he doesn't say a word. And, and, um, I said, uh, I said, Hey, Pastor Dan, he goes, you know what? He goes, where are you putting those? I said, I'm just going to leave them on the counter for Pastor Sam. He goes, I don't even want to know. He goes, just do what you need to do. And he turns around, walks to his office and shuts the door. Oh, yeah. And I just leave the sport caps for him. And, uh, man, we laugh. We still laugh about it. That's but that, that was one of my best stories with Pastor Sam. It's funny but. that he came out like that, too. Like, I could see that perfectly. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah man, it was it was awesome. But... Uh, 
I got I've a got story it. about Shep if you want to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, one time we are on a rally, and it was like the first snow of the year. And um, early morning, like 5 a.m. or something, and uh, we kind of get lost on the way to church. Of course. And uh, first snow and ice, and Shep's got his paper, you know, as his <laughs> map, right? <laughs> And it just doesn't have direction. It's like typed, you know, right. but that's what he follows and we're three right. hours away. And like so, the old map quest printouts. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> and uh, he pulls out his phone, you know, I'm thinking to try to do something, but he's got a flip phone. Yes. So Digital. now we're in the back. Analog, yeah. analog flip phone. Oh, it's wild. Not a, <laughs> not a pixel on the screen. But uh, so he's driving with the paper with, the phone and all of a sudden we hear you know and uh we genuinely thought like this is it like i thought i was gonna die like i'm about to crash Chef goes a little fast anyway we yeah, like it normally yep. and uh this kept happening and one guy in the back finally is just like pastor sam and he just looks up and the whole car goes silent and he looks in the mirror and all you see are his eyes and he just starts to laugh he's like ah what you don't like that <laughs> And he's like, I'm the chef. We're the bombers. But it was great. I yeah, love he's being a part awesome, of his man. Team. He's awesome. Yeah, he's so. Hmm. So cool. we got to share testimonies. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to ask you kind of about that because uh, I talked to different people here, testimonies, and, um, you know, we serve an all-powerful, the right, Bible right. says, all-knowing God. Yeah. And sometimes I'll hear things from people and they say, God helped me in this way. Yeah. Or he helped me in this way. And I wonder, like, um, how do we avoid following a God of our imagination and not... Yeah, you, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, I think, I think God has a way of just, just self-correcting that, you know, on a, on a couple different levels. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of... Um, characters in the Bible, a lot of people who had expectations or ideas of how they either felt God wanted them to act or how they wanted God to act and perform. You know, we see, you know, we see it in Moses' life. We see it in Peter's life. Um, we see it in um, uh, Jacob's life. You know, um, you know, we, we kind of live our life out and we have, you know, theologically, like what we call presupposition, like these presupposed ideas of who we think God is or, you know, what we think he is, you know. And, and God has a beautiful way of transcending all that and penetrating all that, you know, when we yield ourselves to him and, you know, he self-corrects that. Yeah. Um, and we, we've all had moments like that in our life with yeah. God. You know, um, where, you know, uh, where we may not think God loved us and, you know, and then all of a sudden God just breaks through and does something overwhelming, you know, for us. And you just kind of break, you know, yeah. or um, where you think, um, you know, you're getting away with something and then all of a sudden God calls you on the carpet, yeah. you know, and deals with you, right? So I think in, in all those ways, we, we kind of have an imagination about who or what we think God is. You know, even though we read, you know, we, we know from the word, you know, who he really is and what he is. But it's like it doesn't register all the time until he kind of, you know, we have those encounters with him. Yeah. And he just kind of, you know, shatters all that. And, you know, and that's really what brings us close to him. Right. You know. The and course correction. Yeah, hmm. yeah, absolutely. So, I think I had a moment recently, like you're talking about, and uh, I was watching a sermon of yours, and something <coughs> happened I wasn't expecting, and um, I broke down midway through your sermon, and I was like crying for a long time because you brought up something that I've never said, and. Um, I feel like it being said makes me an enemy of certain people. So I wanted to just say, uh, you were talking about the Bible being offensive. Yeah. And you said that there are people in the gay community you love. But one thing, like scripture says, they won't take part in 
you know, eternal glory. Right. And I was hoping you could talk on it. It's a hard thing for sure, me. Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, I don't know how much you know about my background, but I was a, a professional classical ballet dancer for 20 plus years. Um, you know, and that, that community uh, lends itself, you know, towards homosexuals. And there's a, there's a lot of, you know, LGBTQ uh, community in that profession and all the arts, you know, Hollywood, yeah. business, all, all, all of that. Um, you know, we probably had, <clears throat> you know, as funny as it is, my director uh, from Cleveland Ballet, um, he liked hiring heterosexual men. Um, he said it made his life easier and he was a he's been married to the same man for 40 years hmm. so you know this is a you know he's he's a homosexual a br brilliant director and um, you know was a friend um, but you know that was you know he got a lot of grief uh, you know it wasn't we weren't living in the polit politically correct environment we live in now yeah uh, because he'd never get away with that um, but he was very vocal about it. You know, he's like, homosexuals drive me crazy and they're hard to work with. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as a, as a heterosexual, you, you know, we couldn't say anything. Like when he would talk like that, we're like, hey man, it's your show. Yeah. Just, you know, renew my contract. I'm, I'm fine. Um, but I worked, I worked with a lot of, uh, a lot of gay men and, and some were, you know, very close friends. Um, I've lost a lot of friends to AIDS. Um, you know, one of my oldest friends, Aaron Hartnell, um, he was an actor. He's done a lot of, you've probably seen him in some movies. And uh, he was an incredible dancer um, and, and a great friend. We were friends since we were 13 years old, running the streets in New York City. And, um, you know, we've had some real heart to hearts before he died. And, uh, you know, and, and um, you know, these are people, these are... You know, these, you know, we, we, it's very easy, you know, when you're not a part or affiliated with that community to just kind of label people as horrible and they're coming after our kids and all that. You know, we hear this rhetoric and politically, you know, these things are becoming true. You know, we are seeing that happen. Yeah. Um, but these are lost people, you know, and, and um, as offensive as that is, you know, and that'll get you fired from any secular job today to say something like that, right? Yeah. You know, I have, I have friends that, you know, worked in the, um, you know, in the uh, uh, private sector and, you know, they're in corporate America and, and they've lost jobs and positions for voicing, you know, their Christian point of view on things. Right. Um, but, you know, one of the things I said, you know, in that sermon, I say, you know, whether whether you shout it and you're aggressive about the gospel or whether you're very soft spoken, um, the gospel is offensive. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, truth is truth is exclusive, but absolute truth, you know, and the truth of the gospel is exclusive um, and it is narrow um, and it is absolute, you know, and you're either going to fall on one side of that, and not just in the gay community, but, you know, in, in every walk of life. Hmm. The gospel is the most polarizing truth of eternity and in this world. And, um, you know, we're starting to see Christians in this, in this um, you know, country persecuted for it, and we're gonna see more of it. Um, but you know, as far as the gay community, we, we love the gay community, um, you know, as we do, you know, the community of Islam, you know, everything going on now with the Palestinians and, you know, and, and all, you know, the Muslims and, um, you know, these things, like just everything's just kind of at a boiling point. You know, we love these people, yeah. Um, but as Christians, we're called to the Great Commission to preach the gospel. And so, you know, we can't tiptoe around that and we can't be shy about it and we can't be afraid of it. Um, you know, what breaks my heart is I see a lot of Christian leaders, uh, even in our fellowship, very afraid to address things that really need to be addressed. Yeah. Um, because young people need to hear it. You know, lost people need to hear it. God said... Um, you know, God said, I have chosen the foolishness of the message preached to save the lost. Um, and so we're called to preach the gospel and it's offensive and it's going to make people hate us um, as it made people hate Christ and the apostles. Right. <coughs> but we, um, you know, but if we don't, people are lost. Yeah. And, um, 
you know, I hated the gospel when I wasn't saved. I hated pastors. I, I couldn't stand Christians. Even after I first got saved, I couldn't stand Christians. You know, when I first met the Lord. And, <laughs> right, you know, we're, we're a strange crew, you know. And, um, you know, and, and uh, churchy people always made me nervous, you know. Um, I was always more comfortable around gangsters and artists and wild people. Because yeah. uh, I felt like they were easy to read. You knew where they were. Yeah. You know, the, when I yeah. first got saved, like, you know, church people, you know, they were really quiet and it was hard to get a read on them. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> so, but anyway, yeah. And so, um, you know, my heart is uh, to see people saved and see their lives change. And, you know, anyone could walk through the doors of this church. We've had people here get delivered of heroin. Uh, we've had people come out of all kinds of uh, things in the life. We've seen supernatural healings here. I had a woman stage four cancer. <coughs> she has a clean bill of health today. I had a young man um, named Andrew. His mom's name is Sharin, an Arabic family, I think. Uh, they're from Egypt originally. Um, but uh, he had a spiral fracture in his tibia. You know, they're going to do surgery. He's, I think, 11 or 12. He did it playing soccer. And um, we prayed over him, and, and um, uh, a couple days later, they went back, you know, to get another x-ray to see how they were going to proceed, you know, with the surgery and all that. And, and his leg was totally fine. You know, Whoa. that's the upside. That's the awesome side, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, the downside of it is um, if, you don't, if you don't preach the truth, God's not going to affirm it. You know, he's not going to confirm his, his word. Uh, if it's not preached in truth, yeah. right? And so, um, you know, so that's where, uh, you know, that's where we are with that. Mm. Yeah, I know it's hard because um, it's not like they're just a community that's somewhere else. It's like they're in our family. Yes, they're yes. Our close friends. Yes. And I just wonder how to show love to them, but still also point them towards Christ. Yeah, and, and so... Um, you know, like I, I said, the message is always offensive, no matter how kind or gentle we are about it. Um, because at some point, you know, the question is going to come. So what you're saying is if I don't repent, you know, then I'm lost. And that's, you know, that's where truth is exclusive, right? Mm -hmm. That's where, you know, you know, we have to be honest that, you know, all ways don't lead to Christ. At the same time, you know, just because someone from that lifestyle repents, doesn't mean everything's going to change overnight right you know um you know i'm sure you 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 were struggled maybe with anger or frustration or anxiety before you got saved and after you got saved even though it's mitigated right you still right you know um <clears throat> moses you know tended to be an angry man when he was you know serving under pharaoh right he killed a guard oh yeah and uh and and after God, you know, walked with them for 40 years and did one miracle after another, he still had anger issues, right? When he struck the rock twice. After God told him, hit the rock, and he lost his temper and struck the rock. And God said, you know, because of this, I'm not going to let you go in the promised land. So, you know, so everything doesn't just magically go away, but the control of those things over our lives are broken, right? And, and that's the message um, that we have to preach, but it, it really comes down to repentance, you know, acknowledging I'm a sinner. Um, the only, the only answer to my sin is, is the gift of God's grace, um, you know, and regeneration through the cross and the, the death and resurrection of Christ. And, and that's really where we need to focus <coughs> because if, if they can hear that message and they can understand that, you know, Christ loves them, and they yield themselves to him you know the work begins yeah you know they they surrender they repent like all of us have to um and that's really you know and that's really the message you know not that we walk into the kingdom of god and we're perfect overnight right um i think you know i think if there's anywhere that the church has to grow a little bit um you know like if you're an alcoholic and you come to the church and um and you slip up or there's a struggle there here and there you know the time's going to come where god's going to just fully deliver you yeah you know and and your life there's going to be transformation you know we're patient 
you know, with things like that. We're patient with the family going through divorce or, you know, the divorcee, or we're patient with um, someone who struggles with pornography or something, right? Well, you slipped up, you know, man, let's pray. Let's put this under the blood. Let's get you accountable and let's get you moving forward, right? Like, you know, we're like that with those, those sins. And, and I think, um, we need to learn to be a little more patient, you know, with, you know, with people coming out of, um, an alternative sexual lifestyle. Um, if there's genuine repentance there, right? Yeah. You know, like if someone just wants to come in and, you know, and, and they just want to continue living how they live, no matter what the lifestyle is, um, you know, whether, whether you're heterosexual and you're living together, you know, at some point, the conviction of God has to set in and you need to start living right. Yeah. Right? And so, um, you know, but when there's sincere repentance... And there's a softness towards the Lord. You know, we need to learn how to walk with people um, through their struggles a little better than we do, I think. Yeah. I so. think that's a great way to put it. Because we've seen transformation. Right. We've seen our lives <clears throat> change. But we still deal with similar stuff. Yeah, right. Hmm. You what, know? What would you say to someone who's maybe stuck in sin or, like, feels like they've seen change but can't quite... Um. <clears throat> you know, it's a process. Um, and, you know, it's like I, I met the Lord back in 83, but then I ran from God for 16 years because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. But I had a genuine experience with God. Um, supernatural experience. Yeah. You know, but there were, some, there were some things, you know, like Pastor McLean said to me one day. He said, you know, Adrian, <clears throat> he goes, I just think God's got to, uh, let a little air out of your sails uh, before he can just harness you and use you. And I was like, it's tough to hear. Yeah, that was tough to hear. And he was right. And I had to go bang my head against the wall for, you know, a couple more months before uh, uh, I let God really do what he wanted to do. And so um, I see how patient God's been in my life. I'm sure you've seen it in your life. Yeah. And I think, <clears throat> you know, um, w we need to. Uh, really stand with people and pray with them uh, and understand that God is working a process out in people's lives like that moment of repentance um, you know that is a significant moment but that's just the beginning of the end of our old life yeah you know um, we we look at someone like Peter you know we read chapters like Romans 7 um, where, you know, why am I doing the things I don't want to do? You know, there's a process going on. Yeah. And, um, you know, but God, you know, when we're sincere and we've surrendered our lives, um, you know, God will work that process. Faithful is he who called you, who also will do it, right? Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, especially after pastoring, you know, almost 20 years, you, you see that process work in people's lives. You know, you love them, you're patient with them, you know, you share the word, you sow into their life, you bring them into community. Uh, but ultimately, the Holy Spirit's got to finish that work and make it happen. Yeah. You know, we don't get here overnight. Right. Well, so you've seen them at a, like at a distance, or you've seen it happen enough so that you can identify a certain... Right. Yeah. Sure. Oh, that's cool. Absolutely. And, um, you know, and some people are going to want the Lord, and some people don't. Yeah. And um, here's one thing I've learned, and I think this is significant and profound, because um, God's made this very real to me. Uh, the love of Christ is always redemptive, never punitive. It's always redemptive. Always redemptive, never punitive, meaning, you know, to, to uh, bring, bring judgment on someone's life. Like, like God loves people to bring them to a place of redemption um, and not to just punish them. Yeah, there's purpose behind it. Yes. And so so when I was a younger pastor, I would be very punitive. I would be very punishing in my heart towards people oh. that came and went, came and went. You know, they're like, you know, they're here, they're serving the Lord, and then they disappear for three months in the bars doing whatever. Then they're back in church. And, and, and man, my heart towards them was really, like, I wanted to punish him. I want, you know, I didn't do anything. I, yeah. I played the pastoral role, but I thought... You know, and, and then I began to realize, God began to deal with me one day and say, you know what, 
<clears throat> you cannot write them off. You bring correction, you bring love to them, but always leave the door open for repentance. Always leave your relationship with people that leave the church with an open door because God said to me, I dealt with you yeah, and I will eventually deal with them. And if, if, if you don't leave that door open for them, there's nowhere for them to return. Oh. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, it's not for me to just punish someone or be punitive towards them because they're falling short. God's love is always redemptive. So whatever he's going to work out in their life during this lifetime, it's so that he redeems them and brings them back. And so we have to be receptacles for broken lives, right? We have to leave that door open for people so that when God does deal with them, they feel safe to come back. Yeah. They don't feel like I hate them or, you know, like I, I want to just punish them or say, I told you so. Because one thing I've learned is that people always come back. Really? You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And, um, uh, you know, I've always, you know, people, people have, who have had a general encounter with the Lord, regardless of where life brings them, um, at some point, God's going to bring them back. Yeah. And, and they have to know that, that there's a safe place and a loving place for them to return. Hmm. And so I quit, you know, as a, as a young pastor, you know, I used to get into it with people, warn them and, you yeah. know, God's going to deal with you and all this stuff. And then they repent. I run into them in another church and I'm like, oh man, you're serving the Lord. Yeah, dude, God's done so much. It's like, oh, how come you never came back, you know? Yeah. And you get that un uncomfortable stare because uh, like you, you were a jerk. <laughs> yeah. That's why, because you're a total jerk. They don't say that. Yeah. You know, um, but, but I began to realize, you know, as God began to deal with me, you know, um, I'll deal with them. You just leave the door open and love them when they come back mm. and, and, and leave, them, leave them in a good place so they feel good to come back, yeah. you know? And so... Um, do you think us who are not pastors maybe do the same thing with just yeah we all friends? do it we, yeah, yeah okay. we all do it mm. you know and, and it's hard not to do it you know it's hard especially when you love people I think yeah you know because we take that personally yeah yeah you know we take it personally it's like being in a relationship with someone right mm. and you know they're like you know it's not you it's me yeah. you know I just I don't want to be with you anymore you know you're like all right, well, I understand, but on the inside, you're like, I hate you, you know, I, <laughs> right. I, you know, I hope you get hit by a car, you know, like, Bitterness. you don't, yeah, yeah, you know, and I think you could only be hurt that much because you love them, mm -hmm. right? And I think we, we all get like that in the church. Yeah. You know, I think, we, you know, because in reality, we want, we want the people we love to serve the Lord. Right. And when they don't, it creates this awkward tension of, um, you know, you know of just hurt and and um we we need to be able to love people and let them know you know god loves you and and the holy spirit will deal with them yeah and you know you didn't get away with anything i didn't get away with anything right and god loves them as much as he loves anyone that's faithfully serving god and god will you know god will get get to them you know yeah. and hopefully they'll yield you know and that's where our prayers come in you know yeah, maybe there's like a rest in the fact that like we don't have to change someone's mind. Like that's what God does. And you can't. Yeah, yeah, we can't. We put the message out there, but one thing um, Pastor Sam said to me one time. Yeah. Uh, he said a few things to me um, that have really stuck with me through my ministry. But one thing he said to me one time, we were talking about the anointing. And for those of you know our audience who don't really understand what that is, you know, and and our uh, Pentecostal heritage, you know, the anointing is the, the grace and blessing upon a servant of God, you know, by the Holy Spirit to win people to the Lord or convict yeah. them of sin, right? Oh, he's so anointed. Oh, that message was so anointed. But one thing Pastor Sam said to me one day, and it was so good. He said, you know what, Adrian? It's not us that are anointed. It's God's word that's anointed. Oh. And it's the word that holds the life of God. So all we gotta do is just share that, preach it, put that seed in their heart, and then let the Holy Spirit do what only he can do. Yeah. We can't, right? We can't force people right. 
<clears throat> I ran from God for 16 years. No one who knew me would ever in a million years think this guy's going to be a, a great pastor <laughs> yeah. one day, right? You know, and like I just, I didn't want anything to do with God, the ministry. I knew how real the Lord was. You know, I talked to him every day, but not in a million years. You know, and then I went from, I'll never be a pastor, you know, to the altars of, you know, Teen Challenge, like begging God, I want to be a pastor, you know, I'm called, open the door, you know, and right. it's just so funny, like only the Holy Spirit can do that, right? Yeah. O only God can do that. And, uh, you know, we just need to let him do it to other people because we can't. Right. So. Hmm. I heard a story about you and I'm uh -oh. wondering if it's true. Yeah. It's that uh, <laughs> God changed your life. We may have to edit this out. <laughs> I don't know how to yeah. edit. So. <laughs> yeah. No, it's that God changed your life and um, you know, gave you a new life. Right. And that you went out and you found success and you found a job and maybe even car, whatever. Yep, yep, yep. But you felt like you were living outside of God's will. Yeah. So I was on staff at Team Challenge, I think, at this point, uh, two and a half years, two years. And... Um, and I was called to Bible school, um, and I was going to go. And uh, and then uh, two very well-meaning families uh, that were both very affluent. Um, you know, they they really had a heart for me, and their intentions towards me were so good and and just very loyal. And um, and one of them, you know, said to me, you know, <clears throat> why are you going to go? You know, you you know, at your age, why go to Bible school and like be at Bible school? You know, I can help you get a great job in the corporate world and, uh, you know, get you making some real money because you need money, you want a family and all that. And these are, you know, yeah. good Christian families. And I want to really reiterate that. And they really loved me and treated me fantastic. And, you know, and so I had that going on in one family. Another family is like, hey, you know, um, uh, you know, I started talking to them. What do you think if, if I go in this direction, take this job? And they said, oh, it's great, you know, and I'm like, but I, you know, I don't even have a car. And the other family said, you know, we'll buy you a car. Go out and pick out a car. And I was like, yeah, okay. You know, again, you know, just loving me and, you know, great Christian families. And so I did. So the one groomed me and prepared me for these interviews. I got the job in Grand Rapids for a great company. Um, and then, you know, the other family bought me a car and then another guy handed me a credit card with $2,000 on Ooh. and said, go buy some suits. You're going to need suits. Yeah. I was set up, but I was totally out of the will of God. So I left Team Challenge um, and, you know, I had my sports car, beautiful car. I had, you know, my new wardrobe. I had a great job and a great office and, you know, primed to be able to meet a young lady and all that. And my goal was, in my mind, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save money and then pay cash for my education, whether I do it, you know, distance or however I was going to do that. And then I'll go into ministry. Um, but God called me to go to Bible school and he called me to a particular Bible school in North Point, which was Zion at the time okay. in uh, Rhode Island. It's now Massachusetts. And then they have a branch in Grand Rapids. Um, but he called me to, God called me to Zion and, and that was the plan. And, you know, uh, I got my eye off, you know, God's will and, and it was a disaster. You know, I was gone eight weeks. I started, you know, I went to a bar because, you know, all the guys were going to a bar. I went yeah. to a bar and, you know, I <clears throat> have a beer, I can have a beer and, you know, I start smoking a little bit. Before you know it, eight weeks later, I'm, you know, getting high again. I'm out of control. Mm. And um, because I was really not where God wanted me to be. And when, when you know, as a believer, when you're not where God wants you to be, then the provision to be there is not going to keep you. Right. Right? So I just felt like, you know, God kind of lifted his hand, not in a vindictive way to destroy my life, but just to let me know, you know, we were talking earlier about that, right? Um, you know, uh, God just kind of let me know, um, this is not my plan for you. This is not where I want you to be. And this is not the direction I want you to go in. So the provision, you know, God's grace and enablement for me to stand and live a good life there. Um, it just wasn't, it wasn't happening, you know, and in eight weeks, it was a disaster.
Yeah. Um, I went back to Team Challenge with my tail tucked between my legs. I called Dan Proust and I was like, man, can I come back? This was a disaster. And, you know, no one said I told you so. You yeah. know, everyone knew it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and I came back and they loved me with open arms and it was all cool. And, um, you know, uh, that first chapel service with Brother McLean, I was at the altar. <clears throat> and um, he preached on uh, that, that Friday, he preached on our inability to trust the Lord. Um, and uh, we put too much trust in money and success. And, you know, he was just talking right to me. And um, I mean, he wasn't, but, you know, yeah. He, he was and and um i went to the altar and i just laid all that down i laid all the fear down you know uh, my sense and my my need for success uh to be successful in this world to do what god wanted me to do all god wanted us me to do yeah you know like he wants all of us to do is just trust him yeah. with his plan simple hmm. and so i went to the altar and i was you know just sobbing and someone came up behind me and they wrapped their arm around me and they're crying too. And I'm thinking to myself, man, would these guys just let a brother have some private time at the altar? You know, and I'm thinking in my mind, like, who is this jerk? You know, laying all over me and crying. I turn around, it's Brother McLean. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I actually just shared this, I think Sunday or a couple weeks ago before I, I went to Romania. Um, and, and man, I was at that altar for probably an hour and a half. And he was there the whole time with me, mm. praying as hard as I was praying. And um, and then after I got up, he hugged me and he said to me, you know, Adrian, he said, God has so much life for you to live. You can't even see it yet. Mm. But if you just surrender to him and let him give you the life he wants you to have, he said, it's going to be so full and so good for you. And um, And then he said to me, he said, you know, because I came back in the program, I did a restoration, um, and I was only in restoration maybe five, six weeks, and then I went back on staff. <clears throat> and I just told Lord, I'm not going anywhere until you call me out. Um, but Brother McLean said to me, he said, you know what, Adrian, he said, I have a real soft spot for you in my heart, and it's a weakness for me. He said, because I just love you like a, you know, like a son. And he said, so for the next couple months, I'm just gonna distance myself from you and so if I don't talk to you a lot, please know I love you and I'm praying for you. He said, but you, you have to get God's will and submit to that. He said, I can't make you do that. And so, um, and so he did for the next couple months, we didn't talk, and we used to talk a lot. Yeah. You know, we'd always hang out and talk and spend time and, uh, or go to the driving range and hit balls or you know, something. Yeah. And he didn't, and after, you know, after a, a couple months, you know, I just, I had a meeting with him and I said, you know, thank you so much. Um, you know, cause all the bells and whistles were gone now. Like there was no acknowledgement. There was no, I was just the guy. Yeah. And um, I had no position, you know, I was just serving, you know, God to the best of my ability. And when you had um, left, you weren't that. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When I left, I was director and, yeah. you know, I had a title and a name and, you know, and I was, I was important, you know, uh, and uh, when I came back, I was just, you know, the guy who failed. Yeah. But in that, um, in that, man, I, I just, I connected with the Lord. Um, uh, there's a, there's a poem uh, that I, I found when I was on staff there and, and uh, I have no idea who wrote it. Um, but it said, <clears throat> I walked a mile with loneliness, or I walked a mile with happiness, and she chattered all the way, but left me none the wiser with all she had to say. I walked a mile with loneliness, and never a word said she, but oh, the things I learned when sorrow walked with me. Oh. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I found that, and I don't know where I found it, I don't know if I found it in a book or written on something, um, but that was really that season in my life. Yeah. And then God, you know, God brought my wife into my life. We met, God began to open up doors and it was like, boom, 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 boom. Hmm. And then I was just along for the ride, you know, and, yeah. and uh, those are good seasons. Definitely. And, you know, now I'm here and, uh, you know, and so God's good. That's right. I've heard you talk about a long time with God before. 
and maybe a sermon that you, you said you had a place that you went to that you would shut the door. It was like the broom closet. Yes. Or something. <laughs> oh, man, I forgot <laughs> about that. Yeah. Yeah, when I was at Teen Challenge, I used to, uh, there was this old storage closet, you know, where the stairs went down right near the Jesus painting? Yeah. <laughs> so they were, they had just finished doing that tile on the floor and they had a bunch of stuff stored in that room. There was no handle on the door. Oh. And uh, and so it just opened and closed and, and um, you know, lights out were at 10 or 10.30, I think, right? 10.05. 10.05, right. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And I would lay in bed and, and I was so freaked out with what I was going to do with my life. And, you know, because my life was a disaster and I'm an ex-ballet dancer. I'm 34 years old. Like, what am I going to do? Like, I had nothing. I was $87,000 in bad debt. I had two cars repossessed. And I felt like I just needed to pray constantly. So when the lights went out, um, I would get up and I would go pray in that room. There was a little window that faced, um, you know, the back 40. Yeah. And a lot of nights you could see the moon and the stars. And I would just sit there and stare up at that and, and just pray. And there was a guy named Bobby who was um, from a, a big Baptist church in Muskegon. And he was on staff. And he would bust me there every night and write me up. Be like, man, you can't be out of your bunk at night. I was like, but I got to get God, Bobby. You know, he's a yeah. big brother, you know. And... Uh, um, and he'd write me up and Pastor Dan would call me up, you know, to the office and he'd say, why were you out of bed? And I, I would tell him, man, because I'm, I'm praying in that room. Hmm. He's like, you can't be out of your bed praying. And I'm like, but I got to get God. You know, I tell him, you know, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I'm freaked out. I'm, you know, I'm, I know I have to serve the Lord and uh, I've got to pray, Pastor Dan. And he'd just look at me like, I'm not going to discipline you for praying. Yeah. So stay in your bed at night. So I'd go back to my room and sure enough, the next night I'd, I'd sneak into that room again and Bobby would bust me. He'd be like, I'd hide behind boxes and he'd be like, man, you can't be in here. And he'd write me up again. Pastor Dan would call me down the office and he's like, you are forcing me to persecute you for seeking the Lord. He goes, and I don't want to do that. So stop getting out of your bed. And I'm like, I can't Pastor Dan, I got to get God, you know? And, and I just kept doing it. And then I'd get like behind other boxes that they had in there. And, and Bobby would come in. He'd be like, man, I see you. And he'd write me up again. <laughs> I see you. So then I quit going in that room. And then I started, you know, uh, the dorms upstairs, the stairs that go down. Mm -hmm. Like near the, um, you know, they had the stairs that go to the exit doors upstairs. Yeah, yeah. So then I started, you know, and I'm small. I'd. I'd, I'd curl up at the bottom of those stairs with a blanket over my head and, and Bobby, Bobby'd catch me and he'd be like, man, what are you doing? And I'm like, <laughs> I'd pull a blanket over my head and be like, Bobby, I got to get Jesus, man. And he's like, go to bed. He'd write me up again. And, and Pastor Dan was like, what am I going to do with you? I was like, let me pray. Hmm. He's like, well, just pray, but just don't bother anyone. Right. I was like, all right. So he just, he let me go after a while. Um, but yeah. I was just so freaked out, you know, when, when we go into Teen Challenge, you know, our lives are basically destroyed, right? Yeah. They're basically a mess. Um, you know, I had a relationship uh, that I came out of that was a disaster. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I lost my career. My family wasn't talking to me, you know, and, and um, you know, you feel like you're never going to recover, right? Yeah. And so there's a lot of panic and all that. So, do you still remember some of that hopelessness and like? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, every time I see my kids, you know, every time I'm at home, you know, you think back to the days, you know, when there was nothing in your life. Yeah. You know, you look back at all of that, and um, you know, you look at your life now, and I remember, you know, I remember Brother McLean saying to me, "God has more life for you to live than than you can see." And if you just let them have control, you know, you're going to, you're going to get there. Mm. And, um, you know, and I am, you know, I'm there and, and, yeah. um, you know, March, I got to go to Israel on a, uh, geopolitical tour with John Hagee's team. Um, you know, uh, the 15th, 17th of October, I got to go to Romania for two weeks. I preached at 11 different churches. I preached at, uh, oh. the Pentecostal seminary in Bucharest. Um, I got to 
preach and lead 23 Ukrainian refugees to the Lord. It, it, you know what I mean? It's like, um, you know, my oldest daughter's in college and, uh, you know, we have a great house, you know, I have a beautiful wife, you know what I mean? And, and um, you know, those prayers matter, you know, prayer, those prayers, you know, matter, those kind of laid the foundation, you know, uh, you know, a lot of the guys and, and ladies in Teen Challenge, you know, they, they think they're just there worshiping the Lord and going to prayer, you know, just because it's part of the program and it's going to help them in the recovery, right? Yeah. But, you know, what's actually happening, though, is you are laying the foundation for the rest of your life. Yeah. And, and you've got to have that in perspective. You know, when you come into the kingdom, <clears throat> you know, Jesus taught us, pray in this manner, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, you know, you come into the kingdom, there's... There's a plan. There's a purpose. Mm. You know, you're not just in there getting clean. You know, you are serving the Lord. You're part of the kingdom. And, and um, you know, and this is part of all that in my life. Yeah. You know, and you have that in your life, you know. And, it's and, unknown to us at the time. Yes, totally. Yeah. And it seems silly. Right. You know, it seems like I always tell my church, you know, prayer might feel meaningless and hard and difficult, but it's the heavy moving of the kingdom. Like it is, it is center for everything, not only of what we're doing, but what's going to happen and the outcome of things in our life. Yeah. And so as meaningless and silly as it seems, you know, it is absolutely necessary. Um, so, Ooh. yeah. You said you went to Romania. Yeah. And we talked about, um, or maybe think of different cultures around the world. And uh, I know things are getting wild lately with Israel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as believers, according to Scripture, does it get better for us or worse? I can't really... Like, I know there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, is well... Is that because of extreme pain? Um, you know, well, things, things are going to get hard. And we're seeing them get harder for Christians in this country. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, the next major event um, you know, depending on your theology and your eschatology, right? The next major event for us, you know, is the rapture. And, you know, all eyes on Israel, right? Because that's really our time clock. You know, as we see things, excuse me, ticking down. But we live in a time, we live in an age that is different. You know, when, you know, when Jesus said, you know, there'll be wars and rumors of wars. Yeah. But the end is not yet. But at some point, you know, um, the end is going to come for, for believers. Yeah. And, um, you know, I am a, I'm pre-tribulation. I, I believe in the pre-trib rapture. Um, I believe in the rapture of Christ and I believe in the second coming. And, uh, you know, the next major event for us is the rapture and that can happen at any time. And, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, and so we are in that season. And the thing, like I, I was telling my church of several weeks ago, um, I was talking about this and I said, the thing that makes this season different in terms of the wars and the unrest all over the world, because we've been here before, you know, World War II had to feel like the end of the world, True. right? Um, you know, the Iraqi war, that, that whole thing had to feel like the end of the war, you know, shock and awe, you know, you know that was horrific. Um, the thing that is different now is the moral place that the world is in. Oh. And that's the difference now. Um, you know, immorality is rampant. The ability to identify right and wrong. You know, even in the Israeli, I am absolutely pro-Israeli. I'm part of Kufi Christians United for Israel. Um, you know, and so I stand with Israel. My heart goes out to the Palestinian people that are innocent um, because all innocent life that's lost and innocent blood that's shed is, a, is heartbreaking. Um, but, you know, the thing that is different now um, is the vast hatred that we see 
and the inability to now distinguish between right and wrong, moral, uh, morally good, good, as opposed to immorality and um, uh, morality versus immorality, um, the inability to even identify what's male and female. Um, the the way the government is going after children and and trying to push on them, um, you know, the false identity of um, you know uh, transgenderism and all of that. You know, we we are in a morally dark place that we weren't before when we were in the midst of wars and rumors of wars, right? Yeah. So it's different now. Right. Um, you also have just about every major player in the world is in play right now. You know, we see China, we see Russia, uh, we see Ukraine, we see the Middle East. Yemen just shot down a, um, uh, a uh, um, drone, you know, a major drone of ours with technology that they got from Iran, right? Um, we see the whole Middle East in upheaval. We have um one of our biggest um uh uh aircraft carriers two of them in the uh in the mediterranean we have another battle team um uh you know over there as well you know and i i can't think of the uh body of water that they're in um excuse me but anyway um you know and so we see the whole world kind of in upheaval right now we have people in america chanting you know death um to america and death to israel we had a million people palestinians marching in in england calling for the death and destruction of israel in the west you know we see that happening in our ivy league schools like like the world is really coming apart at the the seams it's not it's not just one country yeah and it's not just about war like vietnam or world war ii right morally our country is bankrupt. Our leaders are morally bankrupt. Um, you know, and, and this is happening all over the world. So that's the difference today. And so that's why I just feel like we are, we are really on the cusp of the end. Yeah. You know, I just, I just really do. And you can feel the heaviness, hmm. you know. Um, and so, you know, and our, our faith has to be in Christ. What do you think Judgment Day will be like? Um, I don't know, because hopefully uh, we're not going to be here. <laughs> right, so we don't take part in yeah, that. Yeah, right. Um, you know, we will, our works will be tried by fire, the Bible says. Um, and we'll be, you know, the church will be judged according to our works and rewards. Yeah. Um, you know, the, those that appear before the judgment seat um, and condemned, that's going to be a horrific day. Uh, which is why we do what we're doing. Right. You know. Mm. You think it's God's grace that holds back judgment right now or like his second coming because there's so many unbelievers? Yeah, well, you know, God makes it very clear in scripture that, you know, he takes no joy uh, in the death of the wicked, right? right? Um, you know, we see Christ's heart <clears throat> when he went to the walls of Jerusalem and wept over Jerusalem. Um, and that's really God's heart, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, he doesn't want to see people judged. Uh, I had a vision one time um, during a time of prayer and fasting. And um, uh, actually, I take that back. Um, this happened the, the night I met the Lord. Um, but I saw the Lord on the last day, you know, and it was, uh, it was a tremendous moment. Um, and it's a long story. Uh, but we were all on white horses, you know, at the very end, at the valley of, of Armageddon, you know, uh, Armageddon. And off in the distance, you could see the black masses of um, all the nations that were going to come against Christ. You know, the Bible says, a sword will go out from my mouth and I will slay them. And, um, and in front of there, there were just white people on white horses as far as the eye can see. And these were the saints of God. And I remember the, the horse, you know, just moving underneath me. And, you know, you could hear the rumbling of all the horses and the snorting. And everyone was very quiet. And, and then in front of us, through the, the masses, I saw the Lord on his horse. And 
he he had a sword in his hand and the handle was so large that he couldn't even wrap his hand around it. Now, mind you, when, when I was experiencing all of this, I knew nothing about the Bible. Yeah. And, you know, he was in his tunic and he's, he has this huge sword, um, uh, you know, in his hand. And he's just as still as, as his horse wasn't moving. He wasn't moving. And, and thousands and thousands, there was all this rustling. And then there was this amazing quiet that just fell on everyone. As, as people caught notice, like I don't know how he got there, like I don't remember him coming in or walk, you know, his horse walking him in. Like he was just there all of a sudden. And as, as the thousands and thousands of saints caught notice of him and the horses caught notice of him, there was just this hush that began to fall on everyone. And, um, and as we were focusing on him, <clears throat> this was it. This was the moment now. And I was in this valley when I went to Israel, you know, like, like I was there. So I, I saw the valley and it was familiar to me. And, um, but what was so strange about that moment was you could sense the hesitancy of the Lord mm. because this was it. And the people, the nations that he was about to judge and slay in this moment, like this is their eternity. And as we're excited about, you know, as, as much as we're excited about this as being Christians, this moment for him was heart wrenching. And you, you could feel, um, you can feel the conflict in him, right? Because he's about to judge his creation. And it was, it was absolute stillness. Um, and then at some moment, like, you couldn't hear a bird. You couldn't hear the breeze. Like, it was absolute stillness. The horses weren't moving. You couldn't hear anyone breathing. All eyes were locked on him. And then he raised the sword. And he dropped it over his side. And he began to do, like, the sword began to move, like, in a figure eight around him. Until... It was going so fast, his arm was going so fast, it just created like this rainbow of light around him. And then he just took off. And we saw him just disappear into this black mass of people way off in the distance. And when he did, there was a rush of blood that just hit us all the way to the bridles of the horses and I, I came out of it. You know, and it was like, you know, judgment day, like that was it. And I don't know, you know, this picture is painted in Revelation. Um, and I don't know, you know, what the context of all of it was. I know I was there and, um, and it was very real to me. Like I can still smell and feel and sense like I had already been there. Oh. Um, and, and, um, and so I'm anticipating that day, hmm. you know, um, but, but judgment day is not going to be, you know, it is grievous. To God yeah that day is going to be grievous to him and um, you know and in that moment you could sense the incredible divine conflict of having to judge a, you know a world that he created for his love right yeah. so yeah I know that that's amazing by the way it's cool that God gave <clears throat> you that too and I would had yeah, I was like, I was, I had just turned 18 when, when that happened. Oh my so, gosh. Yeah. So it was a long time ago. And the Holy Spirit gives us this, <clears throat> a deposit, right, of our eternity. Right. So in a way, like, do you think that vision, like, is carried through that Holy Spirit or like? Yeah. Us um, is... You know, when I shared that with the people that were discipling me, you know, later on, um, you know, they took me to the book of Revelation, just kind of read that to me. You know, I just wept. I was like, yeah. but I was there. So I didn't understand, like in my mind, like I thought, you know, God was just showing me something cool. You know, I didn't really realize, you know, this is something that is in our future. It's going to happen. And <clears throat> yeah, all these moments that God gives us are to fortify our faith and to strengthen us. Mm. Um, and and you know and paul called people out all the time you know to remember 
you know, or he'll say, you know, I know I've, I've reminded you of this in the past, but I'm going to put you in way of remembrance again to remind you to be faithful, to remind you to check yourself, to remind you to look at your doctrine, you know, to be aware of your teachings, um, to be mindful of those who went before you, you know, to be mindful of those who are teaching you now. Like Paul said that a lot. And all these deposits, whether by the Holy Spirit or by other saints in the body of Christ, all of these things are to fortify and strengthen us for our walk. Yeah. You know? Build us up. Yes, absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. In Revelations, um, I believe it was John, he wrote some letters to churches. Right. And uh, let's close with this. But yeah. um, if you had to write a letter to your church to encourage them, what do you think you would say? I know you do it every Sunday, but... Yeah. <clears throat> you know, we, we, we live in, in the kingdom and all of our, you know, we, we kind of separate everything. Like we live very sequestered lives. Like, you know, we have our family over here. We have, you know, Sunday morning service over here. We may or may not make midweek. Um, we may or may not pray, you know, it just kind of, everything's very, um, compartmentalized. Right. And, and it shouldn't be like that for us. And and so if I wrote a letter, you know, to the church, I would really want to remind us that this is everything. The body of Christ, our Christian community, um, the time we're in prayer, the time we are ministering, like like all of this takes precedence. Not, you know, like I'm an avid golfer. I love golfing. My daughter is a golfer. She wants to play in college. Um, you know, we have all kinds of interests and things, but, but the reality is there's only one thing that matters, you know, and it, it comes back down to the Mary and Martha syndrome. You know, Martha, Martha, you are busy about a lot of things, but there's only one thing that is good. And Mary has chosen that part. Mm. And that's, that would be my letter to the church. Like, you know, we get caught up with so much stuff work and jobs and careers and income and cars and hobbies and boats and sports like you know it's just amazing but there's only one good thing and our life needs to be centered around not just really i'm not talking about just being in church but the church like being the church you know being in prayer being in fellowship um preferring one another loving one another pursuing the lost ministering to people as God opens up doors. You know, this is our whole life. You know, this is our, this is our entire life. And if it's not, it should be, <clears throat> you know, and if I wrote a letter to the church, that's what it would be, you know, quit being Martha yeah. <laughs> and be more like Mary, you know, man. Amazing. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh Pastor man, Adrian. it's fun. I really appreciate yeah. it. It's been yeah, a pleasure. Appreciate you, Lauren. Sounds yeah, good. absolutely. Thank yeah, you. Awesome. Yeah. You got it. <clears throat>